Okay, hi there. Um, how you guys doing? You getting tired yet? <laughs> Hang in there. I'm going to try to be as engaging as I can, and my goal is to bring up some points to consider as you move forward where I highlight a couple of resources, and then at the end I'm going to get into some analyses and some interesting things that we've been learning in my group. Uh, I did a really crappy introduction of myself at the beginning because I showed up like I didn't realize that things started at 830, so I was very flustered, and I'll just mention that I Basically, my fundamental interest is in coming up with more sustainable approaches for infectious disease control, and genomic epidemiology is one such approach, developing anti-infectives. You can ask um, Venus, who's here for my group, uh, and also uh, anything I mentioned regarding genomic islands. Um, we've also got Kristen here for my group, so I'm just going to point to them because unfortunately I have to leave tomorrow, so I'm not going to be around. But I do want to mention that... Um, a bunch of us uh, instructors are going for dinner tonight to the Queen and Beaver, and it wasn't clear, I think, that uh, there's basically, um, you guys are welcome, any of you are welcome to join us. I would love to meet more of you, and uh, so certainly if you're interested, there's a reservation, I think, for 715, but there was no problem getting a reservation. I'm sure we'll be able to get something. Um, uh, that is assuming they didn't have a lot of uh, showing of the World Cup semifinal, but they took reservations, so I guess not that bad. Anyways, but uh, just moving on, I'm just going to be talking to you then uh, about some of my research, but a little bit more also about some big picture points at the beginning. And really one of the key underlying themes is this idea of sort of that we really need to move to more open bioinformatics, and this is an important thing that's really taking center stage in infectious disease control. And open and organized bioinformatics, I wanted to emphasize, and I'll talk more about that and, and expand a little bit on the ontologies that Will has been talking about. And in case I forget to mention it, Congratulations, Will, on your new CIHR grant, because that's one of the few public ones <laughs> that he just got announced at lunch today, or at least he learned about it at lunch today. So um, if you guys know of bright students, postdocs, etc., who are interested in um, infectious disease control and really um, get a little anal about data organization, uh, please point them to Will's direction, because he's going to do a bunch of hires. In fact, a bunch of us are going to have to do a bunch of hires in the next little while, because we've all got a bunch of grants recently, so uh, certainly um, uh, we'd love to hear about if you know of people who are um, interested. So, uh, we have been living through a rev revolution, okay, a revolution driven by data, and this has gotten huge, and I, I just wanted to mention more generally, you know, the amounts of data being generated are significant, and uh, we've passed a zettabyte now, and uh, next is up is a Yodabyte, just so you know. I think that's a, the most awesome one that we're going to get to. But it's going to take a while to get there. That's a thousand, you know, zettabytes. But, uh, but certainly we are really going crazy with the amount of data. And it's actually turning into some interesting sort of ironies that uh, a lot of the genomic data we may sequence and then some of that information may get stored as collectives, collectives of genomic data, may end up getting encoded back into <coughs> DNA to store it <laughs> as code um, because we're having problems with, at least for archival purposes, coming up with more efficient data storage. And I just wanted to highlight, just for reference, this um, catalog uh, DNA.com approach is sort of interesting. So normally when you want to catalog um, data, uh, you're sort of taking zero zero as like a and zero one as um, uh, a G and uh, I don't know exactly which is which but uh, and then you've got uh, one zero as C and and uh, and one one as T so you've got these bytes and all the possible combinations and you're synthesizing DNA so their process is to generate large volumes of a few different molecules and then encoding the data by combination of the molecules. So instead of like synthesizing the DNA to encode your data, and they're going to decouple this and make very efficient large volumes of a few different molecules and encode that data via combinations of molecules, which I think is interesting. But uh, look out for this because this is going to have to happen because the amount of data being generated is huge. And even in just genomic epidemiology, we've got these incredible capacities occurring. And 
I laugh when I do this because I mean I'm saying this is incredible but think of what it was like 10 years ago if you know uh, and th so think of what it's going to be like 10 years from now we're going to be laughing at this oh remember when we only had 6,000 gigabytes capacity right but uh, uh, the longest nanopore read now is at 2.2 megs that's been reported uh, in literature um, granted on bioarchive, but still, uh, and uh, you know that's the size of a you know many small bacterial genomes. So we really are getting to this realm of having some really interesting data that's going to allow us to do um, a lot more public health um, control uh, and surveillance uh, via genomic sequencing. So this is again causing this revolution in public health uh, and leading to this idea of real-time infectious disease outbreak <laughs> investigations using this genomic data coupled with what they call metadata, which I'm not a big fan of because it implies wow. that it's somehow less important. I mean, the genomic data is really important, but also the other data is very important. So I like to think of it as this other data, like lab data, epidemiological, ep environmental data that becomes really um, key. But, and again, I can't emphasize enough, you know, sequencing is cheap, so that's not the hard part. It's the sequencing with this analysis, and that's why you guys are all here, right, to learn about this analysis that uses this shared data that's really, really becoming powerful, and I've stuck in cute animals, and I've got actually even cuter animal kittens jumping and stuff like that just to get your endorphins going and make you feel a bit better about my talk but uh, anyways um, so uh, but this is also leading to a lot of infrastructure needs um, so there's been infrastructure developed for example in the UK with this microbial bioinformatics cyber infrastructure I thought I'd point to a couple of resources just uh, so you guys know that they exist uh, and uh, in particular I wanted to highlight in Compute Canada we now have uh, four uh, clusters, including Cedar um, in, in at SFU that I I just uh, it's named after the official tree of BC. Um, one of these really big, you know, they last for thousands of years, and um, and uh, there's other clusters too: Arbutus, uh, Graham, and Niagara. Um, across uh, Canada, including here at U of T, there's the new Niagara system being set up. Uh, but I, I did want to highlight that these are really cool. Uh, so, for example, this one here is entirely housed under a water tower purposefully. Uh, I usually think of water as an, an evil um, thing near uh, computing equipment, but the idea is this is entirely water cooled and they use the hot water for other purposes. So they actually have this PUE efficiency that's really impressive, which is the for every megawatt you use of computing, it's um, it's how much you use for cooling and support. That's usually double, um, usually one of your biggest energy requirements. So most of them is usually a PUE of two. And so I just thought I'd mention if you're ever using something like Irido or something at, at SFU or whatever, you've got you're really using it's environmentally friendly computing power. Just so you know. But uh, this, uh, in case you're not aware, though, you can for free get Compute Canada accounts if you're at all associated with um, an academic group uh, in Canada and a uh, pretty decent amount of space and you can ask for increased allocation uh, pretty easily through a pretty simple application process. So be aware that that's a resource you can use. There's other resources too um, that have resulted in some bioinformatics platforms. Uh, the, this Germix virtual laboratory um, is uh, one that's been developed over there in the UK. And uh, another one is the DTU, Denmark Technical University, set up their um, bacterial analysis platform that's also uh, available to use. Uh, another one I think is really uh, taken off nicely is um, this pathogen analysis system um, at, associated with NCBI that is being used with the US FDA for this genome tracker uh, network that was mentioned. And the idea is they're now sequencing about 5,000 isolates uh, a month. And basically the idea is they put them up on a tree <clears throat> and every night somebody looks at it and goes and sees if there's clusters forming. And they just try to in real time notice if there's clusters of related isolates. And then the problem is uh, the metadata is, or other data, is not so good um, and well organized. So usually they sort of have to get up on the phone with these people and figure out what's going on. And that can be okay, but uh, I just want to uh, uh, to um, 
the horn of uh, the, that Will is really leading um, some efforts uh, with this uh, LexMapper, applying it to this data and basically coming up with uh, more organized uh, data about food source, etc., uh, to make it so that we can uh, query these uh, more more robustly. But the point is that this is now happening. You know, this is being used. And uh, also, they're in the UK, for example, you'll, they're doing a whole genome sequencing of every TB isolate to diagnose um, and uh, do surveillance for TB. So this is uh, has developed uh, really nicely. But um, there are some issues with some of these uh, resources with uh, either they are sort of um, closed source, like the NCBI one, uh, or they are maybe a web-based application, so you have to sort of upload your stuff to that site. And there's a lot of public health agencies around the world that have um, concerns about that. They can't just sort of take their outbreak data and upload it to another country. Um, that's sort of not the best um, for their security. And so, um, but there have been, a, I, I do want to put a little plug for MicroReact is one resource that Anna over there, I don't know, did you, were you here this morning? I didn't, I remember seeing you. Okay, uh, but anyways, uh, were you, uh, yeah, you were? Okay, sorry. Um, and uh, uh, basically, uh, she'll be talking about this more later, so I'm not going to get into that, but it's a really nice um, visual for looking at data. But the concept of IRIDA, which you're going to be introduced to in this course, but I want to emphasize it's not the only resource I recommend you use. But this resource, really the philosophy is to make something sort of open source so you can actually see the code uh, freely available where you can either go to a sort of um, a web version, like we've got this um, <coughs> version at SFU set up as a public version, or you could install this locally. So we have um, a bunch of resources, uh, researchers around the world who have been installing this. And the idea is to make it sort of modular design so that we can add in more um, features as it grows uh, using Galaxy's workflow engine. I think that will be discussed more as part of your integrated assignment you'll be using this. So again, I'm not going to go into this too much, but I do want to make you aware that the whole concept is Unlike some of these other resources, you can actually install a copy of this uh, from GitHub uh, and you could also, or you can go to a web to use it. But the idea is to make it a user-friendly um, experience and hopefully you'll uh, see that after doing some of the command line stuff you've been doing uh, today. Uh, I also want to really emphasize this sort of, I won't go into detail about all this, but just to say that for this platform, um, that a key underpinning is we were very keen to increase. There's a lot still to be done, and it's very actively being developed um, uh, with a growing community, but that ontologies and data standards are a really important component uh, that we want to increasingly incorporate as part of this, and I'll explain why we care about that. But I just wanted to stick in this acknowledgement slide and say a big thanks to these people, in particular, uh, Gary and Will, who've been real, and Gary, who's really been leading and championing the development of this uh, first version of, of IRIDA, and this growing group of researchers um, that are, are now uh, all funded, uh, thanks to a bunch of successful grants, to continue this work more. And this has been installed in a bunch of places. This picture is actually a bit of out, out of date. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to emphasize that, you know, for example, in Switzerland, a colleague of ours was able just to install it on a machine uh, uh, without trouble. So um, certainly, though, uh, this is something very actively to be developed. And certainly, if you do decide you want to install it, don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, there is a help, uh, you know, we can um, provide. There is uh, assistance provided for help uh, in dealing with that. But um, uh, but anyways, the point, though, I want to make is that, that the goal is philosophically to have it that, you know, we're making something for Canada, and that's being used actively in Canada's public health labs, uh, but also um, have it be that there's a resource for some of these other resource-poor um, countries. So you'll see that I'm, when I mentioned resources being developed, I was mentioning UK a lot and U.S. a lot, because they have a lot of money and they've developed a lot of great resources. But there's all these other countries around the world that want to each have their own ability to do these analyses, but they're much more, they don't have the, 
you know, millions of dollars to develop these by a customized bioinformatics resources. So uh, certainly this is the, the sort of hole we're trying to fill uh, with uh, IRIDA. The um, concept, though, is really to deal with, as was mentioned, you know, we're really sharing microbes globally uh, now. And in fact, outbreaks follow flight paths more closely than simple geographic distance. And I realized when Will was talking that we shouldn't just talk about human flight paths, we should talk about bird flight paths too. But I mean, and so then it got me thinking it's really about the, you know, this, these uh, flight distances of whatever uh, that are really having a big impact on infectious disease um, sort of migration, shall we say. Uh, long distances, but they really are having a notable impact. And if there's a zombie outbreak, I recommend heading north uh, from here or from Vancouver, where I, I live. But uh, but basically, uh, yeah, East Coast not looking so good. Uh, but uh, but I do want to say that this kind of data sharing that's required for us to really be doing global analyses really requires two main things, data quality and data standards and ontologies, or organized data. And, uh, you know, I don't have to tell you that if you have garbage data, even if you have the perfect model, you're going to get garbage results. And if you have perfect data, if you have a garbage model, you can get garbage results. So you really need that um, quality <laughs> data. And in addition to standard operating procedures and accuracy assessment, you know, I really want to encourage you as you move forward in bioinformatics analysis to get to know your methods, you know, really don't just sort of avoid the risk of just plugging and playing things, you know, get to know um, what these uh, methods are doing and always have controls. Uh, so, um, for example, we wrote a paper that just went after we did um, a metagenomics analysis, we thought, well, you know, we learned some things about uh, when we assess the accuracy of tools to figure out what to do. Um, we learned some things, so we thought we'd publish a paper, and we actually got a lot of feedback on that. And one of the most th popular questions was, okay, yeah, you mentioned all this complexity of different tools that are good for different reasons, but what should I use? <laughs> so um, I would say that you can start, you know, Kraken will get mentioned later, uh, but it is good for if you have very um, well-known uh, microbiomes that you're comparing to, like say gut microbiome or something. Uh, but if you're doing something like water, uh, you may want to look at more like um, tools like Megan and stuff that don't sort of force predictions. And uh, but certainly you're welcome to look at that paper, which has some general comments. And in fact, we got so many questions, we ended up doing a little comment note in the paper at the bottom of the paper. There's a comment that was. Um, that they got good feedback on about just general thoughts uh, about this. But uh, also always having controls is really important, particularly for, say, metagenomics analysis, which will get talked about later in the course. Having a positive control is really important and a negative control to detect when you're having, when your analyses are aren't working. And just don't want to encourage that because that, I don't see that with every metagenomics analysis. And if you want to know more, if you're do, like if you're doing metagenomics analysis and you're sort of, um, and this is going to be increasing in genomic epidemiology as we start to do more sort of ecologically based analyses, not just looking at, say, humans with infection, but also, say, um, the chicken, the poultry that uh, maybe the salmonella is coming from, and then the processing plant, and then the environment where the poultry are, and examining the birds. So this kind of more ecological approach or one health approach, is, which is taking off um, does result in uh, you needing to incorporate metagenomics into genomic epidemiology more. And um, CAMI is an, um, uh, an effort and sort of um, uh, international effort to try to do critical assessment of metagenomics interpretation or basically uh, critically assessing different methods as they come out. So check out that. There's going to be more activity in that in the future, but right now, um, they do have some analyses, but they're working on making it a bit more, shall we say, user-friendly for interpretation of all their results. But uh, the other thing I wanted to mention as I sort of just pepper in a few little bits of advice is, you know, just remember the sort of ecological approach, but also not just bacteria. For example, in this watershed study we did, we were looking at um, trying to come up with an improved water quality test. As you guys, some of you, will, many of you will probably know, 
coliform counts are really inaccurate uh, for, say, closing beaches. I mean, a high coliform count means you have a high number of certain bacteria, but not all coliforms are pathogens, and not all pathogens are coliforms, right? There can be protists, etc. And so uh, we are interested in looking at some clean and fecally contaminated water, either agriculturally contaminated or residentially contaminated, and coming up with improved water quality tests by doing metagenomics analysis. And in short, uh, this analysis that was done over a year temporally um, revealed some surprising things, but more in the side of looking at, we looked at bacteria, viruses, and microeukaryotes. And basically, if we just looked at bacteria, we wouldn't have gotten an adequate picture of what was going on. We saw some interesting, surprising synchrony between DNA and RNA viruses. Um, uh, this is just a Mantel R statistic and, um, with uh, the Q value, Q means that you've got false discovery incorporated into your P value. But, uh, but basically, uh, we showed, you know, in Vancouver, this is in the Vancouver area, these different watersheds, that there is a dry season and a rainy season. There's two seasons. It's either wet, very wet, or dry. And, uh, but it was interesting to see that you could really get that transition uh, between the wet season and dry season and really see some of the synchrony. But there were notable differences um, within... Um, a geographic site over time, viruses were more stable versus bacteria, but were more geographically specific. And so we were really seeing some notable differences that were actually helpful in um, the future for future development. But uh, the key was to integrate this other data, you know, this data about geography and um, we had a lot of uh, chemical analysis data, etc., to sort of really flesh out you know, which were the factors that might be driving some of these differences versus uh, confounding factors. Uh, we also were not limiting our microbiome analysis to just bacteria, so it's something to consider in the future. Now, um, I, again, I'll come back to this, but factoring in the ecosystem um, becomes important. I like this slide because, you know, this idea of looking at the other data uh, for data standards and ontologies, we really need the time resource to do it properly. I mean, you have stopgap measures, and people often do this kind of thing, you know, like you don't even bother taking the thing out of the, uh, the doorstop. The stopgap measures can often be very rough, but we really need to do things and make uh, ways to make the process easier. And that's what Will was starting to allude to, is uh, coming up with tools uh, to help with this um, so that you can use ontologies. And I did want to just, uh, you know, mention ontologies are really a way of structuring information that are for the digital age, what dictionaries were for the age of print, okay? So dictionaries were really important in driving things forward in the age of print. Now with we've got this digital material where we can connect it very, um, very easily. This is where we really need to move more to ontologies or standardized, well-defined hierarchy of terms interconnected with logical relationships. So they really are different from just a, a data dictionary, okay? Um, to organize with ontologies, you would have things like, like this, um, and uh, you might have leafy greens, and you've got spinach, but what's useful is it can help resolve some of these issues that you might have. If, say, you have an outbreak of um, E. coli, and somebody says, it's associated with a lettuce, where somebody says it's associated with endive. A computer doesn't know that lettuce and endive are the same thing unless you tell it. Uh, so having those relationships allows you to link terms. So it deals with um, issues of granularity of how specific you are. It deals with issues of taxonomy. For example, in South Africa, spinach is a different thing than um, in most of the rest of the world. And so uh, you know, just to be, it facilitates the, uh, sharing data to at different levels of detail. So some um, jurisdictions might want to share information about their infectious disease outbreak at a very high level, um, a, you know, if it's just associated with a lettuce and they don't want to be specific, or somebody else may want to go down to the particular company because they're comfortable with doing that. So you, this allows you to pull that data together. So um, the other thing it can deal with is semantic ambiguity. Um, I like this because, you know, it's sort of like the chicken is ready to eat or is the, 
is it are we ready to eat the chicken what's going on there and my my pet peeve is the uh uh, scone biscuit biscuit cookie conundrum of <laughs> somebody who got brought up by Scottish parents. Uh, when you talk about biscuits, I think of them as something different than in what is in North America. A biscuit would be a little bit more like a scone, but but basically. Um, it, you know, but this causes literally confusion when I've literally gone to get fish and chips in in, um, in the U.S. and gotten fish with um, potato chips, like Hostess potato chips, not not um, French fries. I don't even know what term to use, right? To buy. so um, uh, the not potato crisps, I guess. Potato crisps. I've gotten uh, fish with potato crisps as fish and chips before, and so. Uh, the point is that you can basically get these things organized and I can't emphasize enough as you move forward with genomic epidemiology investigations, you can do so much by sorting at the source, by doing this, this kind of information organizing at the beginning. This is what they do in many industries, they sort at the source and so you want to do that. That's why you have this um, recycling, you know, of different containers because it's much more efficient. Uh, I did want to also emphasize that ontologies don't mean you have really long drop-down menus. You can have intelligent query information. Now, again, I won't go on about this, but just if you search cookies, you could find biscuits, for example, as an option. Um, but really, a, a key thing is that it allows this sort of harmonization and data harmonization. It allows you to bring in different people's data together, okay, and reduce errors because you can correct. Uh, for example, in this one study, uh, where we were looking at medications, I could not believe how many different ways people could spell ibuprofen when they talked about their child's medication. Um, and we were, I'll, I'll mention that uh, child study later. But it was, uh, you know, just phenomenal to me. But by putting in an ontology, not only could we look at kids' um, microbiomes associated with those who got ibuprofen or did not get ibuprofen, but also we could look at any people, who, kids who got any anti-inflammatory uh, or whether they got an antibiotic and look at these higher level categories uh, more easily because we had this ontology uh, present. Uh, so, uh, as was alluded to, um, you know, Will is really the one leading um, this genomic epidemiology ontology and, um, and really open community-based development is key for that. Uh, I did want to just put in a little plug that um, uh, later they'll be uh, mentioning um, uh, Andrew uh, is going to be talking tomorrow about antimicrobial resistance more in the morning and we'll be mentioning Aero ontology and there's a mobile elements ontology and then this food ontology are sort of like the main focus foci. So if you're at all interested in any of these, uh, certainly uh, get in touch with us. And we actually have a group, a consortium of people. A key is to basically ma maintain like a language. You have to maintain these things and having continual and development. So we've engaged a bunch of researchers uh, around the world uh, who can contribute to this. And certainly if you're interested, um, there's the email address that you're welcome to uh, join us. And uh, we're really at this stage asking people just to sort of sign up and say they'd be interested in getting more information about this. And then, um, and then but most of it would be sort of like, us coming up with ontologies and then having you maybe review components or you might want to propose certain components. Uh, another use case for do using ontologies, I just thought I'd very briefly in one slide mention is this child uh, study, in part because I need to hire some people uh, associated with that too. Uh, but basically, uh, we're looking at diverse data for 3,500 healthy children from birth, uh, is, uh, three months, six months, one year, three years. Um, five years and eight years, and we're going to plan to continue it, looking at genetic and environmental determinants of allergic disease. But it's an incredible data set that's looking at everything, like from how many hours a night they leave, the kids leave their windows open at night, you know, just all this incredible diverse data um, that uh, includes microbiome data. And of course, as you probably have heard, you know, a big factor in development of allergic disease is, appears to be you know, what kind of microbes you got exposed to early in life. And it appears to see, you know, it's all within the first three months. So if you know of anybody who's pregnant or expecting a child soon, get them to just get their kid to crawl around the dirt a little bit uh, until we know better what the 
uh, key microbes are, but uh, but basically uh, a key component of this is data standardization and ontologies to be able to be able to look at all these factors that are playing a role. But obviously we can look at other factors as well and look at microbiome um, associations with other uh, diseases that inevitably some of these uh, kids are getting. And in this case, we have been looking at sort of medications and other factors. But uh, I did want to get into one area a little bit more about sort of enabling global analyses that have been made possible through data sharing and integration. And I'm going to focus for the last bit on genomic islands. What time did I start? 5.20, I guess, right? Okay. Um, so uh, <clears throat> it, this is uh, genomic islands. Um, are basically clusters of genes of probable horizontal origin um, in bacterial genomes and their in archaeal genomes. Uh, generally, using the tools that have been developed to date, they're sort of defined as over 8 KB, but that's sort of varying. And um, it re general, most of them are 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 really um, primarily thought to be phage uh, coming in. Uh, and anecdotally, we're found to get commonly contain virulence factors. So there's a lot of interest. For uh, uh, you know, a couple of decades in this idea, or at least the last decade, and and growing of uh, looking at these and seeing what was there in these regions, I'll just mention. I think there was a Nature Reviews microbiology paper that uh, Gary mentioned, but uh, we have a new paper out on microbial genomic island discovery that came out. That's just a briefings and bioinformatics paper on just methods for analysis and visualization that you're welcome to check out that has some of the more commentary than, than I can provide here. Uh, but uh, the point is, and it reviews different tools, but one of the tools that we made in our group is uh, Island Viewer, which basically integrates now four tools, uh, two um, Island Path and SIGI HMM, it's sort of hard to see here, uh, that are basically um, sequence composition based methods. They look at unusual sequence composition in the genome coupled with other genes that might be involved in uh, mobility. And then uh, Island Pick, which is a sequence comparative method, and Islander, which is a method developed by colleagues who uh, is very, uh, it's very precise. So when you get a prediction with Islander, um, because it actually gives you even, it looks for the tRNAs that. Um, uh, the region might have um, uh, got inserted into and looks for those sequences. So it finds these regions very precisely, uh, but it doesn't have good recall. It's only finding a subset of islands that it can find. Uh, so, um, so you know, this kind of, um, this is a visual representation that we made of these sort of different tools. And uh, you can see here that, you know, there's clearly something going on there of an island. And the idea is you can just very interactively click here if you go to Island Viewer 4 and you can click there and sort of view a vertical view of the area or horizontal view and you can sort of do a with you know a sort of two fingers kind of thing if you've got a Mac but um, and other uh, tools for a PC but you can basically zoom in and out in these regions and look at them um, interactively so it's actually not a bad tool for just looking at a bacterial genome in general and we pre-compute and run all the bacterial genomes every so often so they're there, and uh, and then a key thing though was integrating these other things like virulence factors, um, resistance gene predictions from the CARD that you'll hear about more, the Comprehensive Antibiotic Resistance uh, Database, and uh, predicted by this resistance gene identifier that Andrew is uh, developing, and uh, that's really widely used. And this uh, basically allowed us to do some more global analyses of genomic islands and their association with different kinds of genes. Um, I will, oh, one thing I wanted to mention is Island Path got recently updated. There's another paper out in 2018. And so uh, if you have used this tool at all, uh, certainly be aware that there's a sort of better version now. But we're actually trying to do better. Right now, these tools, they leave the islands are a bit fragmented and not really that, uh, there's many islands that are not predicted the boundaries very well. So we are developing a better method right now um, to uh, identify those. And uh, again, uh, Kristen's going to be taking over some of that work, so you can always bug her with any <laughs> questions or examples. Maybe you might want examples of islands. Uh, but, uh, but basically, 
Um, we're also developing this island compare tool, which allows you to more do a more population-based view rather than looking at one genome. If you want to look at a bunch of genomes, and we're trying to refine the clustering of these islands so that you could see sort of commonly uh, similarly related islands uh, together, and you basically look at a, a tree of these uh, genomes, and it's just again another visualization, another way to view genomes, and you can actually you know, click and drag in a region and zoom in all the way to the gene level or zoom out or click a node here and just look at, say, these two genomes or click a node here and look at these subset of genomes. And then we're interested in adding other features, including antimicrobial resistance gene predictions from the card, uh, which will be uh, very valuable. Uh, so uh, Island Viewer is an example of a tool that's been integrated into this public version of um, uh, I, I, Irida that's available at SFU and uh, but it really what's key for us is being able to do some of these more these analyses and so I'm going to sort of for the last bit talk about uh, you know some of the insights um, we've been gaining and thoughts and I welcome your thoughts on some of these insights so one of the things we were doing is just doing a very simple analysis of regions of genome plasticity so not looking at just genomic islands but any kind of regions where they are conserved in less than 90% of a bunch of genomes. And the idea was we wanted to see these regions, how they treat out as a feature or character versus just a SNV tree. So if you take a single nucleotide variance and you make a tree like you guys learned with Sniffle and, uh, and was very wisely brought up, there's this issue of that things can diverge, you know, with what's happening in the core genome versus the successory genome. But what we found interesting is when we started to look at this, that, for example, this is a data set of Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolates, which is a bug we care about a lot because now uh, in the top three um, pathogens is requiring new therapeutics by, according to World Health Organization, because there is such a problem with um, antimicrobial resistance, it's a really intrinsically resistant bug and we were, so we're working on new therapeutics but also in better ways to uh, track this. But basically there's three different um, groups. If you do a, a, a SNF based tree, you get uh, these sort of uh, PA14 strain-like isolates, PA01 strain-like isolates, and then these sort of other deep branching ones. as uh, as indicated by having an outgroup group or other other species, um, closely related species that sort of ancestral to all of them. And will we do the same thing by using these presence or absence of these regions of genome plasticity as a, a character? So when you're doing a, a phylogenetic analysis, each row of your sequence alignment is basically a character you're looking at, similar to looking at parts of skulls or whatever you might do in classic um, uh, physical um, evolutionary analyses of organisms. Uh, but you basically we find that we get that same kind of tree coming out. And what that but there's differences within those subgroups. So what that tells me is that um, that actually there's a different mobile gene pool associated with these different clades. So these clades are treeing out and the these mobile gene pools are also uh, treeing out, and it's sort of similar to what we know already about sort of bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. We have these three big domains of life that basically are, we think, one of the reasons they exist as three domains of life is that they're not, there isn't enough horizontal gene transfer, right, to make them come together. So you basically have bacteria with the bacterial viruses or phage, archaea with the archaeal viruses, and eukarya with eukarya, eukaryotic viruses. And, but maybe what we should be thinking of is that sort of we've got these gene pools and we think about this sort of phage gene pool or viral gene pool being much bigger, but uh, some estimates are like it's about 10 times bigger than the gene pool in bacteria. And, uh, and that diversity is, is um, you know, awe-inspiring, but maybe we should be thinking of it as there's little subsets of these that are, and that's why we get these trees, um, because we don't really have species by the traditional mating definition in bacteria. And interestingly, a recent paper came out uh, looking at this sort of cutoff we tend to use of 95% for sort of species, and it, that it actually seemed to hold true. 
And I'm wondering if the whole bacterial species concept is just a relationship between how easily viruses can get between each, um, different uh, bacteria that basically when you get to below 95% sequence identity, it's sort of harder for a virus to infect the same, um, you know, bacteria that are uh, that far distantly related. And so then you sort of have start having that bit of a, quote, species barrier in terms of this accessory genome or mobile genome. So I'm wondering if there's like, I'd like to call them gene puddles. That's what I'm calling them. Anyways, associated with these different clades. And that we, what I think we really should be doing in genomic epidemiology is paying attention to what are the phylogeny of some of these accessory and particularly mobile sequences versus the ones that are core and paying attention to how those are the same and different because they may give insights into what can move around and I'll talk more about that in terms of antimicrobial resistance in particular because we did notice that virulence factors, when we did a sort of global analysis, are disproportionately associated with Jomic Islands. And this, this makes sense. Um, we have really ridiculously high p-values, no matter how you slice it, and, uh, to the minus hundreds. Uh, but, um, but basically, this made sense to us because if you think, uh, and, and I should mention that with ontologies, we're able to, or not, uh, classification, I should say, at this stage, we weren't doing ontologies yet. Um, we were able to sort of see that the less, um, the more defensive virulence factors weren't so associated with um, um, genomic islands, like say uh, iron uptake system. Um, it's just a more passive system, but the more offensive ones, like a toxin that directly sort of causes harm. Um, and virulence, uh, those were the ones that were really associated with genomic islands. And, um, and it makes sense to us because if you basically have a, a virulence factor that could kill off your host, your bacteria, and it could kill off your host, say, animal, um, then, you know, you risk uh, by having that gene in there and being too toxic, killing off your host and you would not survive, right? And so anything that sort of kills off a host, their host too much, obviously just doesn't survive and you don't see that. So there's selective pressure for virulence factors to maybe be associated with the mobile gene pool. At least that's what we thought. But then we started looking at antimicrobial resistance. And the idea was, is there any genomic island association as well for antimicrobial resistance, thanks to this genomic island predictor, and thanks to this um, Andrew MacArthur's um, resistance gene identifier, we could pull those together and do a bit of a global analysis, looking at basically all of the, the genomes in um, uh, NCBI sort of complete microbial genomes. Uh, in the short, uh, AMR genes are disproportionately found in mobile sequences collectively, particularly plasmids. Uh, but note that genomic islands are generally underpredicted, so you've got to keep that in mind. Uh, but um, uh, what we found was that this, the association depended on the AMR mechanism. So uh, when we look at things that are depleting the antibiotic in the environment, like it's an enzyme that goes out and, and does like an inactivation or something. So the, the orange are uh, plasmid and the blue is genomic island. This white at the top is sort of the non-mobile other um, chromosome components that basically if you look at this distribution of these genes uh, and you basically get um, this is a sort of all genes uh, you know you get you have roughly about 10% of all genes are in these sort of mobile sequences in all of these genomes collectively for all of AMR it's you know a bit higher but you'll notice that when you start to go to environmental depletion where you're actually putting something, an enzyme out that's actually changing the antibiotic in the environment and sort of more um, offensive, shall we say, in its approach for um, getting rid of this antibiotic that is, that is, threatens it, uh, then you basically are uh, much more likely to be mobile. And we thought, oh, maybe that's sort of like the virulence kind of concept of, you know, you don't want to be... Uh, producing something that then some other organism, there's selective pressure for some organism to come back with something else because you're interfering with their production of antibiotic or something like that. And uh, they're notably that if you just have an antimicrobial barrier method, you get reduced permeability to antibiotic, for example, uh, you're very likely to just be on the chromosome. These are like the efflex systems, for example. 
uh, or you can see flex here, sorry, that's a different category. But the point is that um, we didn't see quite the same correlation, so there's target protection, which is also sort of a barrier method that didn't fit. So we decided to look at other things, thank to talk, talk to some ecologists, but um, one of the things we did notice that this is first observed in these species that we looked at in 1970s, so it's a very recent introduction. So maybe we should be factoring in how recent something came in. And I think it's important when we start looking at genomic epidemiology of antimicrobial resistance, which is a big topic right now, that we keep in mind that uh, when you see something in a pathogen that you're looking at, you have to pay attention to when that first came in because that first came in there, but it probably existed in some or other organism for many, many, many years, right? And so they actually think this particular um, resistance, these are some of the quinolone stuff, that it, it basically is, um, uh, you know, probably in these uh, the marine organisms and then came in uh, to these organisms. So, uh, you know, that you do have to pay attention to when uh, stuff came into something. But the other thing that really caught our attention was looking at generalizability. And I, I apologize on your slides. Um, there's a problem with the PDF version conversion. It made this really wonky, so I've tried to show you the right one here. But basically, um, if you look at the number of uh, drug classes um, that each um, you know mechanism confers resistance to, so when you're looking at these sort of these classes, they're really sort of you know one or two on average um, uh, drugs that this resistance mechanism is conferring resistance to. So it's very specific, whereas uh, the sort of um, EFLEX, reduced permeability, target alteration, and target uh, protection um, to some degree, uh, you know, are basically uh, showing that uh, trend uh, towards um, being more um, uh, generalizable or involving more drug classes. So in short, um, we're still investigating this actively. But uh, definitely, it does look like as we investigate, the specialized AMR genes do disproportionately are more associated with mobile sequences. And what we think might be going on is actually something that we could draw upon from some of the ecological theories out there uh, about evolutionary theory about ecological public goods. So in um, a lot of um, environmental areas, there are many things that um, organisms do where they do as part of communities. And uh, we can think of bacteria as a community where they share the resources. We do it as humans. We share a lot of um, uh, resources. And uh, what we think we might be seeing is this concept of ecological public goods in that the AMR gene optimally benefits all members of a community if it's present in a subset of that community. So for example, if you've got a secreted enzyme with a high fitness cost, you know, it costs a lot of energy to synthesize this thing, like a cloning vector, beta-lactamase, you know, you'll, those of you who've worked in a lab will know that you can get your cloning vector and you can select for your clones and you played on any um, antibiotic containing media on a petri dish and you've got to make sure you keep maintaining it on that because you'll lose that plasmid uh, quickly if you don't keep it on antibiotic because um, there's, it's such a high fitness cost that it has to make this 500 copies or 300 copies of this plasmid that it's making, you know, because you're trying to do some sort of expression system and cloning vector, that it really is, um, it could lose it very quickly. And so really what's happening is these communities of bacteria are probably benefiting from having, uh, say, these, um, some sort of um, uh, antibiotic uh, resistance mechanism that is secreting into the environment that it's basically uh, like, a, say, a bilactamase, that if it's only present in a subset of the members, then that can sort of keep the resistance, uh, you know, keep it um, so it's resistant to that antibiotic, you know, it's keeping the levels down enough so the colony can survive, uh, but doesn't require everybody to be making it. So you sort of have this shared public goods concept. And I think that might be what's going on, and we have to look more at a sort of ecological perspective on how and why um, some of these things are very mobile and some are not, and some of the ones that are more mobile may really be basically more shared public goods uh, versus the ones that are, say, putting up a barrier where basically every member needs to have that barrier if they're going to survive, right, uh, like an e-flex system. So 
Um, I think what we need to do is move towards coming up with more of an equation of you know what shifts between pressure, selective pressure, to become more mobile, be on more mobile or non-mobile for antimicrobial resistance. Looking at things like fitness costs, the data acquired, whether it's secreted or not. I think there's a lot of factors we could look at. Um, I'm not saying we should definitely come up with a score right now, but definitely I think we could come up with something that could aid um, risk assessment, AMR mobility risk assessment. Uh, what we need, though, is more prediction, better prediction, uh, which uh, Andrew MacArthur's group is, is sort of leading a sort of a large effort to improve that antimicrobial resistance gene prediction. They'll talk more about that. Um, and then uh, I think also we need more ecological sampling. I think I really encourage you, as you do in um, genomic epidemiology analyses, to not just think of tracking in one location. Uh, think of the environment these um, microbes are, and we need to understand the, some of the ecology around some of these environments that these uh, microbes are in. Uh, so uh, one last thing, uh, just as I close here, just uh, we are developing to sort of aid more ecological analysis, we're developing this hammer time, which is like, uh, was inspired by hammer time, uh, though I guess you could say it's inspired by Thor or something like that, but hammer time, you know, so in pitch of the music, but, uh, but basically the idea is to develop an a AMR predictor designed for metagenomics data. This is really being led by Rob Biko's group in Dalhousie, and um, this is, um, part of this sort of move to we need to incorporate better predictors for metagenomics data right now, which is very problematic. Okay, so in summary, um, I can't emphasize enough, again, I'm going to say that again, uh, we need more open data sharing um, and data integration, ensuring we have good quality, so pay, pay attention to what methods you're using, look for whether something is forcing predictions and look for um, uh, what kind of precision do you want something with very high precision or high recall as in precision is you know if, you're, if it makes a prediction that you're definitely right or a high recall means it's making all of the possible predictions high, pre high precision might be sort of missing some things and high recall might be making some level of incorrect predictions um, <clears throat> uh, data organization ontologies, I don't think this has to be onerous, particularly if you start this sort of sorting at the source, you know, get your data organized right at the source, and um, but be aware there are tools being developed, uh, like uh, this LexMapper, for example, to, to basically take text that is unorganized and try to organize it better. Uh, in Canada, you know, we've got this IRIDA tool being developed that you'll get introduced to more tomorrow that's supposed to be, you know, really aims to fill a gap in tools that are available. And again, this is being actively developed, so welcome feedback, particularly usability issues that you might have. And also, um, it, I just want to emphasize the fact that we can make these global analyses possible because of all this data. If this data hadn't been all integrated, um, some of these um, insights wouldn't be possible. And lastly, this idea that was first brought up actually by Will, so maybe it's proper uh, to sort of close with this, is just a reminder that we're all sort of linked by these microbes and these jurisdictions are all linked so that we really do have to coordinate efforts, right? Every one of us uh, needs to try to come up with ways. And I wanted to just mention um, if you guys, and I would love comments about it uh, as we get to the end here and get to take any questions all as well, but but uh, I just wanted to get a show of hands of, does anybody feel like in their organization they have barriers to data sharing, like they can't quite, you know, share everything, or do they feel, okay, yeah, we've got one, oh, we've got a few, yeah. And so I would love to, just at the very end, if we have time, we, I don't want to take too much of your time, but... Um, just if you guys have any thoughts, I would love to hear more about that or maybe you guys can collect some information later about what kinds of barriers you have because these are really important barriers that we need to overcome. Uh, but I will just first end with just closing. I just, I really like to thank Claire and Bav and Justin who've been involved in that analysis and, and Andrew's group for that, making that AMR analysis possible. And, uh, Jeff and my group, um, who basically, uh, together with also these, um, uh, great uh, researchers at SFU were able to make this sort of public version of IRDA that you'll be um, uh, using. 
and uh, oh, and then just I, I just really want to thank this great group of people who are taking a lot of their time, busy time, to to do this uh, workshop. And I'm I'm just sort of parachuting in for this one keynote, but these guys are doing so much work, and uh, just uh, please join me in thanking them too for all all they've done. So thank you very much. Comments or just uh, just we just I don't really want to take like five minutes time, but does anybody have any comments on sort of in particular data sharing challenges they have? Maybe to start, yeah. Or do you have questions? Yeah. I'd say jurisdiction is a big one. A lot of times they don't want to share because a different organization, like for example the federal government, might do provincial analyses, and that's a really big barrier I think to data sharing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So can everybody hear what she's saying? Uh, these barriers? Okay, because I encourage you to speak up a bit, but uh, does anybody have any other kinds of barriers that they're facing? Uh, yeah. Um, we have a lot of lawyers, I think, in particular, that are very worried that a lot of genomic data from food samples, and it will immediately be tracked back to the fact that the genome factor, we don't really have metadata linking it back to the food processing system, and we get sued, which is obviously not going to happen. We have to convince a lot of people that don't know anything about genomics that it's safe to actually share our data. Yeah. So, no, it's it's interesting you bring that up. So just uh, to to emphasize, so there's a lot of jurisdictional issues and um, issues around people who may not totally understand the data having some fears about things happening uh, with the data that might be unfounded. I encourage you to point people to what's happening with Genome Tracker. I mean, with Genome Tracker, they're sequencing, you know, five thousand isolates a month. They're just sticking it all up. Yes, they limit the amount of other data associated. They just have, is it food or, you know, um, a, you know, is it foodborne, is it a human isolate, and a generalized localization um, in these regions, for example, of the U.S. And uh, there is other richer data associated with it, but it is very generalized. But nobody's been sued. Nothing has happened, you know. So um, that said, I do appreciate the issues, and I think they are important ones, of you can't just go out and just put it out publicly that, you know, a bunch of isolates are associated with maple leaf foods, for example, and then it turns out that that's really not the source of, of something and implicate a, a particular company. So I do think there's this, this is why ontologies can play an important role. So if you put things into ontologies, then you can basically imply certain things that might be at the more detailed level, and you might annotate that information at the more detailed level, but only release the higher level information. You might not want to release specifically what type of lettuce it was, because what if that type of lettuce is only produced in one part of the country, and it's sort of, or there, you know, you might have uh, referred to a certain abattoir, and there's only one of those abattoirs of that particular food product in Quebec or something. Uh, so you, you can basically change the level of granularity of the information you're releasing, right? Um, yeah. I was just going to comment, speaking of ontologies, that it would be nice to have almost a permission ontology, because so many different analyses can be done with a given genomic data set. And a lot of times you're worried about stepping on people's toes, even though they're not intending to do that analysis. So it would be nice to have a standardized almost ontology where if you can do this, you can publish up to this extent to do this type of analysis, but not this. That yeah, true? yeah, that's a really interesting point. Yeah, because there is, we are ch sort of challenged with that. Unfortunately, we still have this currency. Uh, so he's talking about this idea of maybe a permission ontology and um, just the fact that somebody may want to publish some data and do a particular analysis, but they don't mind if people do other analyses. Generally, the philosophy has been it's sort of like once it's open, it's open. But, you know, I can appreciate that. And I think what it comes back to is we have this problem right now in science, right, with this currency of people have to get publications and they had to get it for tenure and promotions and et cetera and for getting grants and more money. And, uh, and so uh, this is uh, an issue um, that I think it would be nice to address. But... Uh, the, the tendency right now, so I'm on the board for Genome Canada, and um, we've been really pushing for sort of more open data, um, keeping in mind that certain uh, types of data, you know, have notable privacy issues, and certainly there is per perfectly justified reasons for delays on some data, but generally the idea is to sort of get it out 
um, similar to how GenBank transformed bioinformatics. I mean, if GenBank hadn't been made and we didn't get all this sequence data, think of all the things we couldn't have done, right? Uh, but um, anyways, I don't want to take up more of your time. I'd certainly encourage you, if you if you have any questions, feel free. Uh, we've got this dinner at the, what's it called again? The Queen and Beaver. I kind of love that name. Uh, so, um uh, it, it's, it's actually just uh, down on Elm Street, uh, sort of near the Chelsea Hotel across the street or whatever. It's a, a pretty nice, um, it's actually got pretty nice, it's got decent, like, British, some British food that is actually decent. But, uh, um, so I encourage you to do that, and, uh, but certainly um, uh, uh, thanks, and if you have any questions, you can always ask me too. Okay, thanks very much. Mm -hmm.